On my previous video, I was flying some stole approaches and landings. They were being flown at quite low air speeds. Typically, I'll use an airspeed of 50 knots on approach and usually touching down at around 42 knots, something like that. Um, some of the clips on the, on the previous video is flying an approach at perhaps 45 knots. What I wanted to say is if you've just built your aircraft and you're test flying it, don't fly at speeds that low. Keep to a, uh, a safe speed of say 50 knots, maybe even a bit more, 55 knots. Once you've done quite a lot of stalling and you're well aware of the stall speed for different uh, flap settings, different power settings, then you've got a much better idea of a safe approach speed to fly. For instance, on my Bearhawk, flaps up, it will typically stall at around 43, 44 knots flaps down, um, it'll probably stall at 38 knots with power on, but if I take the power off, it, it will appear to stall at a higher speed. It's not actually stalling, what's happening is it's losing air, airflow over the elevators, and the elevators don't have the control authority to keep the nose up, so it feels like it's stalling in a very docile manner. It's not actually stalling power off. Power on, of course, you can get the nose up to, say, 25 degrees, even 28 degrees pitch attitude, and uh, it does quite a decent stall. So it's, it's very important, I think, to work out what your stall speed is before you go into some of these slower approaches. The other thing that I found very important is if you're comparing approach speeds with other pilots, it's important to know what position area you've got in your airspeed indicator. If you're flying stall approaches just by yourself, then knowing the indicated airspeed that it stalls at and respecting that is, is generally an, enough. But if you're comparing speeds with someone else, really good to know um, the difference of position error because you could be talking about two different numbers. Now position error is normally centered around the static port on the aircraft, that's my static port there, and tends to be caused by having either higher or lower pressures around that section of the fuselage where the static port is located. Now the problem is that any variations in air pressure around the static port can cause an error in your indicated airspeed. But there's another part to the position error, particularly on stalled aircraft that are flying at very high angles of attack on approach. And you can actually see on my Bearhawk here, it's sitting at a, a fairly decent angle of attack just in the, in the hangar here. And you can see that the uh, pitot tube has quite a high angle to the horizon. So if, if this aircraft was on approach at the, at the moment, the airflow would be coming up at quite a steep angle to the pitot tube itself. That introduces another error, uh, another part of the position error. And it's quite important if you're going to be comparing approach speeds with other pilots to work out what that error is on your aircraft and to know how much position error they have on their aircraft. So there's a very good way to do this, uh, and that's the National Test Pilot School. They publish a spreadsheet. It's already got all the algorithms in it. And you enter into the spreadsheet the heading and the ground speed and it calibrates the wind vector and your true airspeed it's that simple i, I did it on my bear hawk at 120 knots also at 180 60 50 and 40 knots at 50 knots i did it flaps up and flaps down and i got very very good results it needs it uses three of the inputs to get the result and the fourth one to generate a standard deviation. On most aircraft, when you're flying at a high angle of attack, normally your indicated airspeed will be significantly lower than your true airspeed. And the, and the steeper the angle of attack that you're flying, normally the lower the indicated airspeed will be. So I thought I'd discuss a couple of things that pertain specifically to my own Bearhawk build. The first thing is the engine cowling exit air cooling lip. The second thing is I've installed a butterfly valve into the oil cooler line. I also wanted to show my EFA screen set up on the Dynon HDX. And I've had quite a lot of fun playing around with flow matching the fuel injectors onto each cylinder. I've learned a lot about that, so I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So a lot of aircraft um, with the larger um, engines in them will have cowl flaps installed. And cowl flaps are great. What, what they mean is you, you have a lever on the dashboard and you can open the cowl flaps when you're doing, say, a high-powered climb when you're generating a lot of heat and that will increase or improve the cooling flow around the engine. And then when you're in the cruise at high altitude and low ambient temperature, you can close the cowl flaps and keep the cylinder heads nice and warm. It does add some complexity. I haven't gone down that route. I may do it at a later stage, but I've decided just to have a fixed cooling lip 
and uh, I'm gonna fly through this winter and see how that performs. If, if I need to change it, I will, but uh, here's what I'm talking about. If I look under the engine here, there's a, view, there's a fixed cooling lip there. What that does is it protrudes out into the airflow. It does increase drag a little bit, so there is gonna be a speed penalty. It generates a little bit of turbulence and in turn um, creates a low pressure area under the cowling, and that's where the airflow exits out from the cowling. So air enters into the cowling here in the front of the engine, exits out down here, and in doing so it's drawn down through the, uh, the cylinder's cooling baffles and cools the engine. It also goes past the oil cooler and co cools the oil. So what I've done in this case is I've fabricated two of these cooling lips. They're very simple to uh, remove and install. There's uh, five screws and this one here is larger. That's going to be my summertime one. This one here is a bit smaller, and that's going to be my wintertime one. So one other change that I made on my Beerhawk is I installed a butterfly valve just up above the oil cooling plenum. That's it there, and um, what it does is it has a summer and winter setting on it, so it's currently in the winter setting, and I can simply change it over to the summer setting there. Uh, that's full open, or if the weather's cold, I can go into the winter setting. All it does is it reduces the airflow into the oil cooler and brings the oil temperature up. The reason I did that was because I noticed that um, my oil temperature uh, in degrees Celsius was typically down around 65 degrees Celsius in the cruise. It was a little bit too cool and I wanted to bring it up closer to 80 degrees Celsius. Now one thing I wanted to show is a setup I've got here on my Dynon EFIS screen. I've got these lights down here. They are actually very similar to most of these standard instruments which I've configured just as numbers rather than bar graphs. Um, but these show up as lights and once they're in the, the normal green range, it's actually not green range, I've just got a black range now. So that's showing the Earth X battery is normal. If it becomes anything other than normal, if it detects a fault in a cell, that will turn to amber. At the moment it's showing the oil pressure is low and the oil temperature is cold. Once it's ready um, for running the engine up, those will go black as well. Fuel pump is just uh, detected off the fuel pressure. At the moment it's showing uh, low fuel pressure because the engine's not running, but once the engine driven pump comes into life, that will go into the black range. And if I then turn the, the fuel pump on here, which I can do right now, and you'll see that it will turn um, magenta, sorry, blue in color. At the moment the alternator is off, and once the alternator turns on with the engine running, that will also go black. So this would just be a fairly typical engine start for me. Prime it for about five seconds when it's cold. So another thing that I did on my aircraft was uh, I was reading a lot about running the engine lean of peak, what's known as lean of peak. Some of you will be very familiar with that. Um, up until probably 30 years ago, most engines were run rich of peak. Now, what does that mean? Well, when they talk about peak, they're talking about exhaust gas temperature, peak exhaust gas temperature. So normally you take off with a mixture full rich and let's say you're climbing up to a high altitude. As you climb the air gets thinner and therefore you need to reduce the amount of fuel that goes into the engine. So you reduce, uh, you, you pull the mixture lever out typically and that reduces the fuel into the engine. So you're leaning the engine. As you do that, the, if you do have a cylind, um, an exhaust gas temperature probe installed, you will notice that the exhaust gas temperature will get hotter and hotter as you continue to lean the mixture. Eventually it will peak at its hottest temperature and then it will start to um, the temperature will start to decrease and you're now running on the lean side of peak and that improves uh, fuel efficiency as it turns out there's a huge efficiency gain by running lean of the peak egt 
So that's, that's good, all well and good so far. Now, on my bear hawk, I discovered that if I climb to a, an altitude of seven or 8,000 feet, um, it runs lean of peak quite well. But what I also discovered is that running down around one or 2,000 feet where the temperatures are hotter, um, the engine is capable of putting out more power. When I ran at lean of peak, um, I sort of ended up in this zone where I couldn't lean it far enough back because if I did, the engine wasn't getting enough fuel and some of the cylinders would start to uh, splutter and die a wee bit. That was undesirable. So after quite a lot of researching on the internet, I discovered that you could flow match the cylinders. Now, what's happening is as you uh, reduce the, as, as you pull the mixture out and you reduce the fuel flow into the cylinders, it's not the fuel flow to the whole engine really, it's the fuel flow to each cylinder individually. Now, in an ideal world, you want the exhaust gas temperature on each cylinder to peak at the same time. Now it doesn't need to peak at the same temperature, they all just need to rise and peak at the same time and then come down lean of peak at the same time. That then gives you far more room to play around on the lean side of the peak EGT and uh, at that point you have matched your fuel flows. So how to go about that? Well there's a company called Gammy that offers um, a, a flow matching service and they sell uh, injector restrictors. There's another company called Airflow Performance that do the same thing. Um, I contacted Air Airflow Performance and it, it turned out that you could buy an injector restrictor for about 30 US dollars. And here's what it looks like. Um, there's, there's a restrictor there. It's just a, a small gadget with a, with a hole through the middle and it regulates the amount of fuel going into the injector. So here's the fuel injector that's the fuel line running into the number two cylinder there. That's the injector just there. And at the top is a nut. And inside is, sits the current injector restrictor. Lycoming send their engines from the factory, typically with a restrictor of 0.028 size hole. That's uh, 28 thousandths of an inch. Now it does get a little bit complicated to establish um, what fuel flow you need for each cylinder. And you do that by what's called doing a gammy spread test. You take the aircraft up to seven or 8,000 feet, set the, uh, usually you're doing it with full throttle and at, the, at those altitudes, full throttle at seven or 8,000 feet, you're typically producing less than 65% power. The significance of that is that you're unable to over temp your engine at those altitudes. You can do it down uh, at say an altitude of 3,000 feet, but you do have to be vigilant that you don't over temp your engine and what you would do is throttle it back. Um, then you simply start with full rich mixture and you very slowly wind the mixture back bit by bit. It takes three or four minutes and until you've gone on the lean side of peak. Then you download the data and you can see where each individual cylinder has peaked. You can see here that cylinders two, three, four, five and six all peak at the same time. And uh, the number one cylinder shown in red is peaking later on after all of them when the fuel flow is lower. Once you've done that, and once you've got all of the fuel flows matched, you can then go down to a much lower altitude and you'll have a very smooth running engine and it's very efficient. So talking about efficiency gains, how much are we talking here? Well, typically you do lose a little bit of airspeed when you run lean of peak. On, on my Bear Hawk, if I run rich of peak, 55 litres an hour in the cruise, I'll cruise at 125 knots. If I then go lean of peak, it'll cruise at around 115 knots and it'll burn 38 litres an hour. I can go at 120 knots by increasing the fuel flow up to about 42 litres an hour. So to quantify that, on a tank of fuel, 205 litres, I'll get an additional 120 nautical miles. That's huge, it's a 20% increase, and that's what I do. I've, I've been uh, cruising typically around 112, 115 knots indicated airspeed, and uh, yeah, getting much better uh, efficiency off the engine.